Hey everybody, so I just wanted to make a quick video on Microsoft and I wanted to talk about their next quarter guidance. So this is going to be uh, more of a tutorial more than anything. So, um, you know, when Microsoft releases their earnings report, they usually give out guidance and they give out very detailed guidance. So they're going to give out a quarter ahead or sometimes, you know, for other companies, they might give like a full year of guidance. But in the case of Microsoft, they usually give us a little bit on the uh, full year and then they give us a pretty detailed analysis of the next quarter. So uh, when earnings actually drop, what people want to know the most is what is the outlook. So um, usually when Microsoft gives the outlook, they give it, uh, I think it's about like an hour after the actual um, earnings is released. So you kind of see this lagged effect on earnings date. So um, I know this is a little bit late, but um, better late than never to cover Microsoft and uh, their guidance. So when we're on the investor relations page, there's gonna be these tabs right here. So we wanna click on earnings and financials, and then we wanna hit uh, press release and webcast. So from here, you know, they give us a quick summary of uh, what the current quarter's earning is. And um, keep in mind right here, Microsoft, they're reporting fiscal year 23 Q4. So not all companies follow the calendar year. So a company like Microsoft is actually two quarters ahead of our calendar year. So they're reporting Q4 when um, for our calendar year, this will be Q2. So from this page right here, we want to look at this right side right here. There's downloaded earnings related files. Now, um, we're going to get this Outlook tab. And like I said, this tab is going to show up um, maybe like an hour or two after the actual earnings release comes out. So um, you do want to wait a little bit for this. So we're going to go ahead and click into it. And now we're just going to go through um, the pages a little bit. So right here is what we want to focus on. So Outlook, they're giving us fiscal year 24Q1. So they're giving us the next quarter Outlook. And they're giving us in very good detail here. So they're telling us, okay, well, this is going to be our revenue. This is going to be our cost. This is going to be our tax. So from here, it's up to us to create this income statement that's going to put more sense out of these numbers right here. So um, also do note that they give us the fiscal year 24 full year guidance as well, but this is not as detailed. So you can see right here at the next quarter, they can tell us with a uh, pretty good precision on uh, what these numbers are gonna be. So um, now I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna take this right here, a screenshot of this, and then I'm gonna move it over to um, a spreadsheet right here. So as you guys can see, I already did that and I left a lot of notes here. So of course, I'm gonna go ahead and link this spreadsheet down below in the description so that you guys can view it at your own leisure. So right here, um, like I said, you know, Microsoft, their fiscal year is different than our calendar year. That's something very important to understand because if you don't know this, you might get very confused. Well, why is it fiscal year 24 Q1? But um, you know, that's essentially the reason. So um, now what we wanna do is we wanna break out these line items and we wanna categorize them. So as human beings, you know, we always want to categorize things. So this is just another instance of that. So right here, we have uh, productivity and business processes, intelligent cloud, more personal computing. Now, if we see right here, it says revenue, revenue, revenue. So these are all revenue accounts. So, you know, this will go under the revenue section of the income statement. Right here, it says cost of revenue, operating expense, and then effective tax rate. These are all expense accounts. And then right here, we have this other income and expense. It can be either revenue or expense, just depending on what that number is. So here it says expected to be roughly 300 million. If this was an expense, this would be a negative amount, which would be um, pretty much uh, expressed with a parenthesis. So in accounting, uh, you would see a parenthesis around a number to um, basically say that it's a negative number. So in this case, this is revenue. So we wanna put it in our revenue account but we don't necessarily want to mix it up with this revenue because this is other income and expense. This is not related to operating income. So we do want to categorize that separately as a separate revenue bucket. So now um, we're going to go ahead and we're going to build that income statement. So right here, I have a list of formulas for you. And um, this is just explaining some of the calculations. So all my calculations are going to be highlighted. So when you see something highlighted, that's gonna let you know I did a calculation right there. So um, another thing to note before we actually get into this 
they give us everything in a range. So as you guys can see, it says revenue of 18 billion to 18.3 billion. They're not saying, okay, well, revenue is going to be 18 billion or, okay, revenue is going to be 18.3 billion. They're saying it's going to be 18 to 18.3 billion. So um, what I like to do is I like to create a low and a high to express these different amounts. So this will give me a better understanding of what that ending range earnings per share is going to be because that's ultimately what we would like to calculate here. So starting with revenue, we have productivity and business processes, intelligent cloud, and more personal computing. So when we add all of these up together, we're gonna get 53.8 billion on the low side or 54.8 billion on the high side. So there's about a $1 billion difference in revenue between the low and the high. And then now we're gonna move on to uh, the cost. So we're going to have cost of revenue. So cost of revenue or cost of goods sold, that's going to be uh, 16.6 .6 billion on the low side, 16.8 billion on the high side. So now we're going to take this calculation and it's going to be called gross profit. So gross profit is essentially going to be our total revenue right here minus our cost of goods sold. So that's going to give us 37.2 billion on the low side and 38 billion on the high side. Now we're going to do a calculation. It's going to be called gross margin. So gross margin is essentially going to be our gross profit divided by our revenue. So this is pretty much just telling us, okay, well, the product, well, when we create this product, um, we're essentially going to maintain 69 cents out of every $1 of sales. But then you have to remember that there are other costs after this. So this is pretty much just telling us, okay, well, this is pretty much the, um, margin of the uh, product that we're selling before these operating expenses. So now we jump into operating expense. So this is pretty much, um, you know, your uh, general and admin and all of that stuff. So, you know, this is, once we get to the operating margin, this is really telling us, okay, this is how much we're retaining from selling these uh, products and services after all of our operating expenses are done. So um, right here, we're gonna have operating profit. So operating profit is essentially gonna be our gross profit right here, minus our operating expense. So here we can see it's 23.7 billion on the low side and 24.4 billion on the high side. So when we're actually looking at the operating margin, this means that what we're actually taking home is going to be 44 cents out of every $1 of sales. So that's actually not bad, that's pretty good. So now we're gonna have this um, other income. So it could be other income or expense, but like I said, in this case, it's um, going to be income. Now um, this other income and expense, it's usually not related to operations. Because if it was going to be in operations, they would have put it in this revenue bucket right here. But um, this is usually due to other things. So it could be like interest, it could be a lot of things. But um, right here, we see that it's 300 million and we're adding that. So now we have this line item, it's called income before tax. So what we're doing right here is we're getting our operating profit and we're adding this other income. So right here we have 24 billion and then we have 24.7 billion on the high side. So now we're gonna do our tax. So they said right here, if we're just looking at this, our effective tax rate is around 19%. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, as you guys can see in this calculation, I'm going to take 19% um, out of this income before tax. So this is what's getting taxed, this 24 billion. So we're taking 19% of this. So that comes out to be 4.56 billion out in tax. And then um, on the high side, that's gonna be 14.69 billion. So that makes net income 19.44 billion on the low side and 20.01 billion on the high side. So now we have to calculate earnings per share from this number. So the next number that we're gonna need is we need to figure out what our shares outstanding is going to be. So on this next tab right here, I have some shares outstanding estimates from uh, prior years or prior quarters, I mean. So um, right here, you guys can see um, for um, March 31st, we have about 7.464 billion. 
and then we have about 7.467 billion in the most recent quarter and then the quarter before this quarter we have uh 7.473 billion so the number is not changing a whole lot as you guys can see it's literally um just this fractional amount right here so um in this calculation you know this small change isn't going to make that much of a difference here so i am going to assume that the shares outstanding is going to be very close to this 7.467 billion. So that's essentially the number that we're using right here. So 7.467 billion. So now earnings per share is pretty much a calculation getting this net income and dividing it by the shares outstanding. So that's going to be $2.60 on the low side, $2.68 on the high side. So what we want to do now is we want to compare, okay, well, what is the earnings per share growth in comparison to the same quarter in the prior year? So um, last year for this Q1, it was $2.35. So that means that the earnings um, per share growth is 11% right here and 14% uh, right there. So let's go ahead and uh, change this into a percentage real quick. So there we go, um, that's our percentage right there, our percentage growth. So that's actually not too bad because um, we're seeing like a 10.8% growth right here and a 14.02% growth right there. So the next thing we wanna do is um, when we get earnings per share in quarter, you know, that's not gonna help us calculate um, the uh, price to earnings ratio because if we're gonna calculate price to earnings ratio, we need four quarters worth of earnings per share. So we have this um, calculation called trailing 12 month EPS. So what we're doing is we're essentially getting the most recent four quarters of earnings per share. So right here, we have this estimate of about $2.60 or $2.68. And we're looking at the quarter before that, which is the one that we just reported, the quarter before that one, and the quarter before that one. So we're looking at the four most recent quarters and this Q1 2024 is a projection. So right here, we're actually um, looking at forward, um, forward EPS. So this actually isn't a perfect trailing 12 month because trailing would imply that it's um, the most recent four quarters, but this one hasn't even happened yet. So we're actually doing something slightly different where we're projecting um, out into the future. So right here, if we're taking the four most recent quarters, assuming that this one just happened um, and assuming that these numbers are pretty accurate, then we're going to have $9.93 on the low side and $10.01 on the high side. Now, if we're looking at Microsoft price, the price is going to change all the time. But as of right now, it's $316.94. So if we're going to do um, forward price to earnings, we're essentially going to get this number the stock price divided by the um, forward earnings per share. So when we do that, we're gonna get 31.91 and then we're gonna get 31.66 on the um, high side. So how do we actually use these numbers? Well, one of the best things that I like to do is I like to look at the um, company's historic price to earnings. So right here to the left, I do have a chart of that. So we can see right here on this chart that um, a majority of the times it's staying above uh, 20. So we can also see that in the most recent years. So let me just scroll down a little bit. It's just a little bit higher right there. All right. So we can see in the most recent years, you know, it's maintained something over 20. But um, you can see once it gets into this 30 territory, it starts getting a little bit overpriced. So um, we can usually see that um, somewhere in the mid 20s might be a little bit more reasonable. So uh, given that the forward price to earnings is above 30, might just be a little bit of a red flag. And there's some other things that we wanna pay attention to. So um, we wanna look at revenue growth. And if we're just looking at 2023, revenue growth was only 6.88%. In the prior years, we saw 17.8%, 17.5%, 13.65%, and so on and so forth. Also, we want to pay attention to earnings per share growth. 
So in 2023, we only saw 0.31% earnings per share growth. That is very, very little. Now, um, the prior year, we saw almost 20%. And we saw almost 40% the year before that. So yeah, earnings per share and revenue are really low um, just for the entire year. So does it really make sense that you would want to pay a high price to earnings multiple? Uh, maybe or maybe not. It just depends. So if I'm strictly looking at this based off of today's financials and also the next quarter's financials, I would say that this is very, very, very overpriced and I would not want to touch it. But then the complicated thing is you have to think out a little bit further. You have to think, okay, well, how much is this AI thing going to help Microsoft? And then you have to think about something like um, the Activision Blizzard um, acquisition. So if we're just looking at um, this little thing I found on Google, it says, okay, well, they're expecting October 18th to be the new acquisition date where um, they're going to get that merger then in. So in the past, you know, I believe that this was supposed to happen in March of this year. So it's definitely got pushed out. So, um, you know, if it does happen, you know, what is essentially going to happen? Well, essentially, um, you know, they're going to absorb this company. And that essentially means that they're going to get all the revenue and all the profits and all of that. So, you know, what would that mean for Microsoft? Well, the merger will pretty much make uh, Microsoft revenue growth look a little bit better. So it's going to be like about a 4% bump. And as for net income, that could be about a 2% bump. So these are very rough estimates based off uh, Activision Blizzard's um, revenue and net income. So it's we don't necessarily know if uh, what Microsoft is going to do with this company or um, how they're going to transform their earnings. So this is pretty much just a rough estimate based off of what Activision Blizzard is doing today. So um, this will just give you a rough idea. So um, in the future, you know, I do think that we can definitely expect some revenue growth just from this company being absorbed um, as well as um, growth in the bottom line as well. So this is pretty much my analysis of um, Microsoft and I hope you guys enjoy it.